Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church here at North Jacks this morning. We're so glad that you're in the Lord's house. I'm so happy that you're so happy to see each other, but you guys need to find a seat. All right. The people that are tuned in online are like, guys, we were in our place. We were ready to go. Everybody in the room's got to get in their seat. But we are so glad that you're here for all of you who are in the room. Some of you are still wandering around looking for a seat. If you can't find it, there are some of the balcony people are like, we have room. So if you need to go up there, uh, there's some space up there as well. And then this is a great time to encourage you. We had a great service at 9 o'clock. And uh, if you're interested, it's the exact same service, same music, same preaching. And so you're always welcome to come at 9 o'clock as well. But we are so glad glad that you're here. So glad for those of you that are tuned in online that you're watching with us as well. And also, if you're here... All right, y'all, for real. Like, we haven't opened the nursery yet. I feel like I'm in it. Our first-time guests, they're not going to figure out about their Connect cards. All right, here we go. So, if you're a first-time guest and you're here uh, and you're listening and you can hear everything that I'm saying, uh, we're so glad that you came. And we're glad you're at church today. We're glad that you came to worship with us. And we'd love to talk to you about the experience that you have with us. So what we want you to do is fill out a Connect card. You'll find one on the pew right in front of you. And if you'd grab one of those cards, fill it out on both sides. What you're going to do with it is wait all the way till the end when church is over. Go out into the foyer. There's a Connect Center on the right-hand side. Drop that card in the box and that'll let us know you're here. And we'll talk to you this week about the experience that you had. We'll get in contact. If you're watching online, go to our website. There's a green banner that says connect. You click that, you'll fill out the same form, and we'll get in contact with you as well. We know there are many of you who wish you could be here worshiping with us, but for any number of reasons you can't and you're watching online, we want you to know that we love you, that we're here for you, and if you need anything, please reach out to us during the week. also want to thank you for your continued faithfulness to give. Y'all have been so faithful, and because of that, there's been so much incredible ministry that's happening, so many plans that are going to be unfolding here in the coming weeks. I'm going to have a great update for you next week from our church planner in Colorado, Shannon Kelly and his wife Elise and their team at True Point. We're excited to share that with you next week. But just know that when you're giving online, when you're dropping your offerings in the boxes that are outside the doors, you are doing it to God's glory and it's being stewarded here for the kingdom work of Jesus Christ. And we're so thankful for your generosity. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. We've got some exciting things this morning. And I know that God has something fresh and unique that he wants to do in this place with this group that is gathered, and we want to make sure our hearts are ready to receive it. So let's pray together. Father, we love you. We're so thankful for this day, thankful for an opportunity to come. God, I'm so excited to be in a church where there is a, there's life present. God, I'm thankful to hear the sound of little boys and girls that are here in the service, to hear folks laughing as they fellowship together, to hear folks who are excited about being in God's house, to sing his praises, to hear his word preached. And God, we're thankful for a church that's not just surviving these times, it's thriving, and it's because of what your Holy Spirit is doing in the life and in the midst of our church. And so God, we don't take it for granted, and we're thankful for it. God, I pray that as we go into this time of worship that you would draw near to us as we sing your praises. God, I pray that you would give us ears to hear as your word is preached. We thank you for a pastor that powerfully preaches the uncompromised word of God. And we pray that you would give him a clear word for this moment. That, God, we would be challenged by your word and that the lost would be saved because of the power of the gospel. And that they would repent of their sins and put their faith in Jesus. And that all of us, that you would ignite faithfulness and obedience in us. That we would be changed by your word. God, God, we give you all the glory for what's going to happen in this place. We pray it expectantly. We believe something is going to happen, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, right now we have a special recognition to make, so I'm going to turn it over to Dad. Well, this recognition was supposed to be in May, but all of that was upended because of the pandemic. So we have put it off until today, but today we're recognizing a ministry anniversary, and it's a biggie. We're celebrating the fact that Brother Chris Corum has been our associate pastor for business administration here at North Jacksonville Baptist Church for 30 years. And so I'm going to ask him and Susie to come and join me here. If y'all will come, both of y'all come right over here. And uh, I, I have a few things that I need to say and I want to say because this this is a great, a great celebration, and it's a great accomplishment. And uh, when I think about all these years, first of all, I think about your longevity. Uh, Thirty years is a long time, and in ministry, it's the same like dogs. It's dog years. So you have been doing this 
210 years. Yes, sir, brother. And, uh, but there have, you know, not a lot of folks stay this long in ministry and in one place. And uh, there are challenges. And a lot of times folks throw in the towel and give up. And as I look back over your years here, I see you really leading us through three great crises. One was in the very beginning. When I came here, the church had relocated, a great vision of former pastor and leadership, but they'd moved out here. And, but uh, through a series of events, uh, it had come to this place. Uh, Chris meets me first week, and, uh, you know, he's serving here on staff, had been on staff for a while, and he said, uh, now I just want to let you know right up front, the... Um, Checking account says we got $1,000 in checking account. And he says, but we really don't. I'm shuffling about $50,000 worth of bills. We had a $65,000 a month mortgage payment. And um, we just talked about it, and I said, you know what? I said, um, God's going to take care of this. We got a big God. And so Brother Chris led us in our initial debt retirement campaign. Uh, we had Bill Stafford, the great evangelist, come and preach on spirit-filled giving for Sunday morning through Wednesday night. And uh, we watched God pay off that five and a half million dollars early, and the church began to meet budget and began to give because the principle we began to follow is the more we give out of this ministry and other ministries, the more God would give us to serve Him here which blew some of the guys' minds initially. So anyway, but that's the way we began to serve. But Chris led us through all those, through, that, through that, initial, that initial crisis, and things just turned around. And I could tell you miracle story after miracle story. The second great crisis he led us through was about 2008 when uh, the bubble burst and the bottom dropped out of the economy. But Chris came to me early, and he said, uh, I think we need to shrink the budget by 10%. He said, I'm seeing a trend here. And I said, okay. And uh, we did that, and we, we, made, we went through that entire time, never had to lay anybody off, met all of our missionary obligations. He led us through that crisis. Then the third crisis we're just coming out of, and that is when we were told in March that, we had to shut down, and for nine weeks, we could not meet in person. Well, what a blessing that first week when everything shut down. Brother Chris comes to me. He has laid in store during the days leading up to this, you know. Uh, he's laid in store some, tells me exactly where we are. Uh, we, he had already led us and moved us to online giving, and uh, through his leadership, and the blessing of God and your, and your willingness to give. March, when we shut down for two weeks, the offerings were more than March of last year. April, when we didn't have any in gatherings, offerings more than April the last year. We come to Easter Sunday, the offerings bigger, even though we're not meeting in here, than the last year, and the same for May. And it's been an absolute miracle. And, um, and I just want to tell you this. We talked, and I, I looked to him for advice on all, on all of this. And I stay out of the putting my fingers in all the finances. But um, we talked, and some churches, and I, just, I feel like I need to say this because I thank God for you. And there's nothing wrong with this, but some churches and ministries uh, avail themselves. What's it called? The... Uh, the, the payroll protection plan that the government offered. And some churches took that. I think it gave you payroll protection for six weeks or something. But Chris and I talked. And we said, you know what? And this is just us, right for us. We believe God is going to meet our need, not the government. So we determined not to take anything from the government. And, we, and, our, and listen, our... our our feeling was, our feeling was, how can we stand up and tell you to trust God when you're facing a challenge if we don't trust God? So I'm telling you that it's not 
the government that helped us through this. It's God. So, Brother Chris, led us through this longevity. Second thing when I think about Brother Chris is integrity. I'm telling you, we have an outside audit every single year. And they always say the same thing. The finances of this church, the way they're handled, is a model that we wish other ministries would follow. There's never been any question of the integrity of the finances of this church. And Brother Chris has many quotes that we could quote. But this, if there's ever a book of his quotes, this is going to be the biggie. I never met a receipt I didn't like. That's where the Chris Corm right here. In fact, I'm telling you, when I was looking through my wallet, when I came in here, I thought, I think I lost one in there, but no, I'm just teasing. Integrity, total honesty. And the third thing is faithfulness. First of all, in his marriage, they've modeled faithfulness, he and Susie, with their kids and their grandkids. Uh, he's involved in a great Sunday school department here in the church. He loves the Lord Jesus Christ. But I think the highest thing that a pastor could say to a staff member is what I'm getting ready to say to you. After all these years, as your pastor, I trust you implicitly. And I want to thank you for 30 years a faithful service to the cause of Christ. And on behalf of the church, I want to give you a gift. But Miss Susie, we know behind every great man there's a greater woman. And so we wanted to give you a gift too. And I want you to thank Brother Chris and Miss Susie for 30 years of faithful service at North Jacksonville Baptist Church. Love y'all. All right. God bless you. Well, as you're seated, we're so thankful, uh, as we've said the past few weeks, for all the boys and girls that are here. If you're one of our boys and girls, if you're sixth grade and under, just wave at me. I want to see if you're at church today. If you're babies all the way up through sixth grade, wave at me, kids. Wave at me. Hey, they're up in the top. They're doing like this. We are so glad you guys are in church, and we love that you're here with the folks that brought you, and it's so important that you come to God's house on God's day. And we're looking forward to the opportunity where we can get you guys in small groups and do discipleship with you and have some children's church and things like that. But we're so thankful for families that have been faithful to bring their kids to church in the midst of all of this craziness. And so that's why a few weeks ago we started carving out a special moment on Sunday morning just for you boys and girls. So pay close attention to this week's Kids Moment. Stories of the Bible. Jesus calls Peter. This is Jesus. Hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Jesus grew up in Nazareth hey, Jesus. and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. Jesus began teaching about God's love and healing people of their sickness. One day, John saw Jesus walking by and told the people around him that Jesus was the Lamb of God. One of the people standing with him was Andrew, whose brother was Simon, who would later be known as Peter. Andrew went to find his brother and said, We have found the Christ. Whoa, Ray, come on. Simon went with Andrew and met Jesus. Uh huh, I'm Simon. Jesus looked at Simon and said, Your name is Simon, son of John. Yes, it is. But you will be called Peter. Uh, okay. On another day, Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and lots of people crowded around him to hear what he had to say. Oh, uh, uh, hello. Well, oh, okay. Jesus noticed two empty boats for Andrew and Peter had left them and were washing their nets. Jesus stepped into one of the boats and asked Peter to take him out into the sea. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Peter, Now go out where it is deeper 
and let down your nets to catch some fish. But Peter said, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. Whoa! They called to some other fishermen for help. Hey, help! And soon both boats were filled with fish. When Peter realized what happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. Jesus replied to Peter, Don't be afraid. Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Really? Really. And as soon as they landed, they left their nets and followed Jesus. So Simon Peter became one of Jesus' 12 disciples and followed his friend Jesus throughout his time on earth. throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's sing together.
Colossians 1, 16 says, For Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things have been created through Him and for Him. That's why we bring Him our worship this morning.
Well, praise the Lord. I'm preaching a series of messages from the book of Jude with a specific purpose in mind, and that is for us to consider all the great doctrines of the Christian faith. The title of the series is Believing and Behaving, because what you believe will affect and impact how you behave. And it's an amazing thing that Jude, which is one chapter, touches on every major doctrine of the Christian faith. I want you to turn to this little book of Jude right there before the book of the Revelation, and I want to read verse 4. And I'm preaching today on this subject, truth twisters, truth twisters. And in this message, we will consider the doctrine of Christ, His person, His character, His nature, His work. Jude verse 4. Would you please stand with your Bibles open in honor and reverence for the reading of God's holy, inspired, infallible, inerrant Word. And the Bible says in the book of Jude in verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn, they twist, the grace of our God into lewdness, and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. God, put your words in my mouth. Fill my mind with your thoughts. Lord God, I pray I will speak the truth under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I must decrease. Jesus, you must increase. God, fill the invitation with Holy Spirit conviction. And I pray because of our encounter with your word today in this service, we'll never, ever be the same. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. And you may be seated. You know, I heard somebody say one time, they said, I, I don't believe, they said it just like this, I don't believe in doctrine or nothing, I just believe in Jesus. Well, doctrine means teaching. And what Jesus teaches is vital and what the Scripture teaches about Jesus is vital. And you cannot live a dynamic, grounded, successful Christian life based on what you feel or on some experience that you have. Your life has to be grounded in truth, in the teachings of the Word. That has to be your foundation. And you go from the milk of the Word to the meat of the Word. I'm telling you, if you want to have victory in your Christian life, it comes by you encountering consistently the truth of Scriptures. If you're going to have victory in your Christian life, you've got to understand that it is the truth that will set you free. Now, Jude warns us that there are those that are teaching false truths and false doctrines, and you've got to be careful who you listen to. Two, because Satan has his teachers, his preachers, his emissaries that with a seductive voice seek to lead you not only away from the truth, but away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to find out whether somebody is true or false, examine what they believe and what they teach about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to get to that place in this verse, where in a nutshell, in a very concise statement, Jude sums up who Christ is and what we must believe about Him. We have to deal with these false teachers because they don't want us to see Christ as He really is. I want to make three observations about these false teachers. First of all, I want you to notice, according to Jude, they conceal who they are. They conceal who they are. They don't just show up to the church and say, I'm here to just preach a bunch of false doctrine and mess people up. No, the Scripture tells us that they will come in concealed. People are unaware that they're a false teacher. They come in disguise. Notice the Bible says in verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Now, when the Scripture uses that word crept, it means to come alongside of. It literally means they came in the side door. 
Now, Jesus warned us about this in a parable in the book of Matthew chapter 13. He said, Satan seeks to corrupt the church, to divide the church, and to weaken the church by planting people in the church who are not there to do the Lord's work, but to do the devil's bidding, and not there to preach truth, but to preach falsehoods. He talks about the tares in the wheat, and he tells this story. He said, here's a farmer, he's got this, this plot of ground, and his enemies decide we're going to bankrupt him, we're going to ruin his crops, and this is the way we're going to do it. While his field hands are sleeping, we're going to sneak in there and sow tares among the wheat. Tares, it's what's called a bearded darnel, a particular kind of weed that looks like wheat in the beginning of its growth. And only after the, the heads begin to burst forth on the wheat, and the bearded Darnell, can you tell the difference? And by that time, the root systems are all entwined, and the field is corrupted and worthless. And what we need to, to see very clearly in that story, it's while men slept. It's while the people who had the truth slept. And the church today has to wake up. And we need to understand that we're not going to impact our communities by dumbing down the doctrine of the church, to make it more appealing by watering down the Word of God so it doesn't offend people. I'm telling you, we have got to loose the Word of God exactly as it's presented in the Holy Scriptures without any kind of compromise, and we've got to stand true to these Scriptures, and especially what they teach us about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there are the tares in the wheat, and it's while those people slept. And we've got to wake up, and we've got to know what we believe, and we've got to stand for the truth. And so Jesus said you need to be careful because the devil is going to plant alongside same pew, going through the same baptistry, sitting in the same small group, in the same worship service. There will be saved people there, but there will be lost people there. And, and sometimes Satan has that particular. Notice how it says here in verse 4, certain men, some are just lost church members, but some have infiltrated the church with an agenda to teach a false system of doctrine. Now, I want, I want to explain this to you. They got in the church because they made a profession of faith. They said, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but what Jesus do they believe in? Because there are a lot of people saying they believe in Jesus. Some say, well, yeah, I believe in Jesus. He was a good man, or he was a great example. Or he's one of, he's one of many gods. Or as one cult teaches, Jesus wasn't always a god. He became a god, and, and what he is, we can become. And they teach all of these all of these philosophical fables about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Scripture says here, having come in the side door, I believe these kind of folks usually do it like this. They'll get a little Bible study started in their home. And then they get some gullible people around them, and they become their guru because they don't want people to honor and love Jesus Christ. They want their ego fed. And if you're, if, if, if you're following somebody that just wants the attention and wants you to talk about them, you're following the wrong person. Because let me just tell you right now, this is not a cult. This is a New Testament church. And I don't want you to be my disciple or the disciple of one of these staff members. I want you to be a growing, glowing, going disciple of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because it's not about us. It's all about Him. And I just want to take a moment here to tell you, friend, there's only one star, and it's the bright and morning star, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one rose in this garden, and that's the rose of Sharon, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one lily in this valley, and that's the lily of the valley, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they gather a little group around them. They begin to teach them false things, and they distract them from the only truth that's going to shape and change their life forever. Notice what else the Scripture tells us about these people who are concealing who they are. They can't conceal it from the Lord. He knows their heart. Notice what he calls them in verse 4. He says they are ungodly men. And that word ungodly means without reverence. It means no fear of God, no reverential awe of God. It means they look great on the outside. They're impressive on the outside, but God's looking at the heart. And he says when I look at their heart, I'm not seeing Christ in their heart. 
False teachers, false prophets. Now, let me explain this phrase here so this doesn't confuse you. It says in verse 4, For certain men, these false teachers, have crept in. They came in the side door under the guise of a true teacher, made a so-called profession of faith, but their tares in the wheat. They came in unnoticed. It says they are ungodly men, but it says who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Now, let me explain to you what that means. Some people say these particular false teachers were predestinated by God to infiltrate the church. Do you understand that the word predestinate is used four times in the New Testament, and it does mean to mark out beforehand. It's not the word used here, but it does mean to mark out beforehand. But the word predestinate is used four times in the New Testament. Every time the word predestinate is used, it is used in conjunction with the second tense of salvation, not the first tense of salvation. Now, see, salvation's in three tenses. First of all, you've got justification. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, He took your sin and gave you His righteousness. You've been declared righteous in Jesus Christ. That's justification. Just as if you've never sinned, God's declared you righteous. All on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus. But you never find predestinate or the word predestination connected with justification which is salvation from the penalty of sin, judgment in hell. It's always connected to the second tense. Well, the first tense is justification. The third tense is glorification. That's being saved from the very presence of sin. That's, that's the final tense. When you stand safe in the presence of the Lord, we looked at that in the first message, eternal security. Those he justifies, he's going to glorify. You stand redeemed. You stand with a resurrection, body and life in the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's glorification. So what's the second tense of salvation? That's sanctification. Pre that, all four times you find predestinate New Testament is connected with sanctification. Sanctification is the process, the ongoing progressive work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer whereby the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God. And as we apply the Word of God to our heart, He begins to shape our conduct and our character and our conversation into the very likeness of Jesus. We are predestinated to be conformed to His image. God didn't predestinate you to go to heaven. He didn't predestinate anybody to go to hell. If you accept Christ, you go to heaven. If you reject Christ, you go to hell. But God has predestinated that you be conformed to the image of His Son as you take in the Word of God and let it shape and mold you into the likeness of Jesus Christ. It's plain as a nose on your face. Plain as the nose on your face. So what's the Scripture saying about false teachers? It's saying long before they came into the churches that Jude's writing to, God had already warned. All through the Old Testament, as we enter the New Testament, God is warning. Jesus, in His Sermon on the Mount, which Josh is preaching about on Wednesday night, talked about beware of wolves in sheep's clothing, false prophets, false teachers. So this is nothing new. Jude is saying, this, is, this should not surprise us. It's also that phrase saying, they can't fool God. God's marked them out. God looks down at a congregation. He knows the saved, the lost, the true, the false. And those that are teaching false doctrine, those that are leading people astray, are under condemnation and judgment. And even though they may fake people out, they will never fake God out. And when they stand before Him, they'll say, well, now wait a minute. I was a guru down there on planet Earth. Man, listen, I, I wrote books. I had CDs. People followed me. They loved my name. They loved who I was. I made a lot of money off of that ministry. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me. That's what that verse means. 
So these people want to diminish who Christ is and draw attention to themselves. And they want people to be man followers and not Christ followers. But there's a second thing I want you to notice about these false teachers. They misrepresent grace. Misrepresent grace. Now, I'm not making this up or getting this out of Reader's Digest. This is right here in the Word of God. It says in verse 4, these ungodly men turn the grace of our God into lewdness. And the word lewdness there speaks of no restraint. There were people in those days, and there are people like that today, who say, oh, you get saved by grace, and then you just live however you want to live. Just live a life of sin because you're saved by grace. Let me explain to you something about grace here. The Bible talks about the manifold grace of God. That means the multifacets of the grace of God and the many sides of the grace of God. First of all, they're saving grace. He's talking about the grace of our God. The Bible says, by grace you're saved through faith. I love grace. They sing about grace today. Grace warms my heart. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Thank God for grace. Grace is a gift. It's God's unmerited favor. Salvation is a gift you receive. But somebody paid for that gift. It's not cheap. That that gift of grace was paid for by the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Saved by a gift I receive, but paid for by the very blood of Jesus Christ. There is saving grace. Now, this is what happens. When you get saved by grace... Grace does some, some things in you. Grace puts in you a new nature. You're now alive in Christ. And grace imparts in you a desire to love and honor Christ with your life. And grace also empowers you to live a life of surrender to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So they're saving grace. But then they're sustaining grace. And I speak today to people sitting right here that are walking through many challenges. Some of you, it may be a physical challenge, a financial challenge, or a family challenge. But you're walking through tremendous adversity and difficulty. And you feel like there's no way you can make it through. You're at your breaking point. You're ready to give up. You say, Pastor, I can't take any more. The Apostle Paul came to that point in his life. Here's a man that got shipwrecked, that didn't bother him. Got thrown in jail after he got beat up, that didn't bother him. Got run out of town, that didn't bother him. Threw rocks at him, that didn't bother him. But he had a thorn in the flesh, according to 2 Corinthians 12. That word thorn means a stake, a long spike. He had an adversity in his life, pain in his life, a challenge in his life, a difficulty in his life that was so hard He said, Satan used it to buffet him. Is that the way you feel today? Your challenge, your adversity, your difficulty, you're getting beat up by it, beat down by it. It's taking the wind out of your sails, so to speak. Paul says, this this thing was so hard. It was so hard that he said, I asked God not once, but three times. I said, Lord, would you take that? Would you take this adversity away? Would you take this pain away? Would you take this thorn away, God? But God answered him, and he said, no. But he said, my grace is sufficient for this moment in your life. And Paul found that it was. There's a sustaining grace that comes to the Christian at times like this. Grace is the gift that keeps on giving. Grace is the gift that keeps on empowering. And I've watched people sitting right here over the years. I've watched you experience the sustaining grace of God. I've watched some of you, I've watched some of you walk away from a cemetery having buried the body of your little baby, but God gave you the grace to go on. I watched you walk away from a cemetery having to bury a teenager, but God gave you the grace to go on. I've watched many of you have to walk away from a cemetery, your spouse, your husband, your wife, having their memorial service, 
and God gave you the grace to go on. I've seen some of you fired, seen some of you face tremendous physical challenges. I've seen some of you go through stuff with your family. I've seen, I've seen you go through physical pain, whether it's heart disease, sugar diabetes. I've seen you walk through so much, and I'm telling you something I know because God says it, but I've seen it in the life of this congregation. I've watched people Walk with this grace, and I have seen over and again that God's grace is sufficient for your hour of need. Absolutely. And to think somebody is going to twist that precious, powerful grace that was purchased with the blood of Jesus and say, just go out and live in sin. Go out and live like the devil. It's wrong. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace empowers you to live a victorious Christian life, overcoming sin for the glory of God. But then there's dying grace. Corey Tin Boone, who would be imprisoned in a Nazi prison camp, when she was a little girl, she used to talk about how she, she didn't fear death, even when they were in that prison camp. She had to stand by and watch her sister die there, how she didn't fear death. And they asked her, why didn't you fear death? She said, my daddy taught me something when I was a little girl. I said, Daddy, I'm afraid to die. He said, Honey, don't worry about that. He said, When we get on the train, he said, When do you give the conductor your ticket? She said, I don't give him the ticket until I get on the train. And he said, Honey, always remember this. God won't give you the grace you need to face death until you're going to die. And I want to tell you something, my friend. I've watched that happen again and again. I remember going to the home of one of our men who used to sit right down here on the second row. He was on his deathbed, and I went over there to his house, and some of his friends, Christian friends, were gathered around, and they were talking about Jesus, and they were singing about the Lord. And when I walked in, he raised up on one elbow. He loved Southern gospel music, man. He went to every gospel sing between here and Mars. He never missed one. I want you to know, my friend, when, when I walked into that room, he, he got up on one elbow and he looked at me and he said, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Hallelujah. It's more than a song. It's a truth. And when you come to that point in your life, God will give you that dying grace you need. So these kinds of folks will twist the grace of God. And we're living in a day and age where people say, if we're going to attract people, you know, we can't talk about the what you shouldn't do. Well, I'm just telling you, there's lots of things we can do on the positive, but there are just some things that Christians should not do. The Bible says we're a peculiar people, and that doesn't mean weird or odd. It means we're different. Here's the third thing. And don't miss this. These people, false teachers, they conceal who they are. The second thing is they misrepresent grace. But here's the third and the worst thing about them. They deny the deity of of Christ. When we talk about who Christ is, we're talking about he's more than a man. He's second person of the divine trinity. The scripture teaches us he was, is, and always will be. Jude gives us the four wonderful titles of Christ here that show us he's more than a man. The Bible talks about the name of Jesus, and when it talks about the name of Jesus, it's talking about everything I'm going to talk about right here. It's talking about who he is. Look at these four titles. Understand how special Jesus is. Understand why we preach Christ and we follow Christ and we worship Christ and we lift up our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are Christians. We are Christ followers. Understand why he's, listen, he's not alongside Buddha. He's not alongside Krishna. He's not alongside some modern prophet. He, he's not alongside deity. He's above all. He's above all the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what it says about him. Look at these phrases. It says in verse 4, they deny. Well, how, how do people deny Christ? How do they deny Christ? It's sad Christians can sometimes deny Christ. Simon Peter denied Christ. Let me tell you this. Some people deny Christ with their words. The way they talk. Man, they're going, eh, that guy didn't know Jesus. With their lives and their actions, somebody looks at them and says, eh, they don't know Jesus, anybody act like that. Some, sometimes because they're actually teaching wrong things about Jesus. In that way, they deny the Lord Jesus Christ. But you want me, you want me to tell you, I'm not trying to make you feel uncomfortable, this is just the truth. You want me to tell you a way that sometimes God's people deny the Lord? When you quit 
because the going's gotten tough. I mean, if, if, if things are difficult right now in your Christian life and you're going to quit serving the Lord Jesus Christ, what does that say about how you view Jesus Christ? The Bible says they deny. Who are they denying? The Bible says, notice this, they deny the only Lord God. Jesus is, Christ is called the only Lord God. Did you see the word only there? There's not five gods, six gods, ten gods, twelve gods, lots of different gods to get to heaven. No, there's one God. You say, y'all are excluding people. I didn't say it. God says it. And God, the Bible says there's only one God, and he's revealed himself to humanity in the person of Christ. Jesus Christ is the second person of the divine Godhead. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We see Christ in the Old Testament. I want you to know he was, he is, and he always will be. He said, I'm the Alpha, that's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. I'm the Omega, that's the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I'm I'm everything from A to Z. He is the prophet of all the prophets, the priest of all the priests, the president of all the presidents, the grand poobah of all the grand poobahs, the potentate of all the potentates. There's nobody above him. He's above all. The Bible calls him the Lord God. He didn't become God. The Bible says he's always been God. But notice the second thing it says about Jesus Christ. The Bible says he is our Lord. Do you know in the life of every Christian, there comes that moment, I believe, when you have to determine and decide Jesus Christ is going to be the absolute Lord of my life. I had that crisis in my own life as a young teenager after I got my salvation nailed down that I had to decide and determine whether Christ was just going to be resident in my life or if he was going to be president, if he was going to be a passenger or if he was going to be the absolute ruler ruler of my life, if he was going to have the preeminence. And the reason you've got confusion in your life and you don't have direction and you don't have peace is you're in charge, calling the shots, and trying to be in control. And every believer has to come to that place where they relinquish control and say, Jesus be Lord of all the kingdoms of my heart. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's called Lord more times in the New Testament than he's called Savior. We don't just get hell insurance and then live our life the way we want to live it. No, he saved us that he might reign in our heart, that he might sit on the throne. And when you come to the place where you put your life, your dreams, your finances, your hopes, and even your failures in the hands of Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I abandon myself to your lordship, that's when you'll really start living. And that's where some of you sitting right here are. You're at this moment of time where you've got to decide if Jesus Christ is going to be Lord of all. But no, Notice what else it says. It says that he's called Jesus uh, to deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus. Jesus means Jehovah saves. It's the name Joshua in the Old Testament. And the Bible says this is what's wonderful. Don't ever forget this. And I tell you what, it's a thrill for me to get up here to be able to proclaim it this morning. If I had a thousand lives, I wouldn't have enough lives to to say what I'm getting ready to say. What an amazing thing that Christ reigned as the second person of the divine trinity up in heaven. He basked in the glow of heaven's hallelujahs as angelic beings cried, Holy, 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 one holy for God the Father, one holy for God the Son, and one holy for God the Holy Spirit. But we're down here, we're lost, we're doomed, separated from God. We need a Savior. We, we, need, we need someone who's holy man, but holy God. And so our Lord Jesus Christ stepped off of his throne, turned the stars into a staircase, came down to this sin-cursed earth, clothed his majesty, clothed his deity in the body of a peasant carpenter, lived among those he had created, rubbed shoulders with sinners, was betrayed by one he had trusted, was beaten by mere mortals. They took the hands of Christ, the hands that carved out the Grand Canyons, the hands that made the Great Smoky Mountains. They took the hands of Jesus that flung stars out there where there had been nothing. They took his feet, the feet that led him on a mission of mercy from the hallways of heaven to to this crazy world in which we live. 
They nailed him to that cross. Now I want you to know, my friend, having, having nailed him to that cross, they lifted that cross up, and as the blood flowed from his brow, and the blood flowed from his back, and the blood flowed from his hands, and the blood flowed from his feet, hanging there on the cross, he was wounded for me, and he was wounded for you. He took our place. We should have been crucified. He's bearing our sin dead. He's, he's satisfying the wrath of God against our sin. And I want you to know, my friend, taking the judgment of God on our sin, Jesus, a man called Jesus, a man who came from heaven named Jesus, God poured out his wrath on Christ, and then Jesus Christ, it is finished. And because Christ came down to this earth and took that human body and bled and died, we're forgiven. We can go to heaven forever. What a lovely name, the name of Jesus. Oh, listen, my friend. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Well, the Bible says not only is he Jesus, the Bible says he is Christ. And Christ means anointed one. Christ means he's the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. Jesus didn't come like his plan B. He was the plan. He, he came, promised, out of the nation of Israel as the divine Son of God, one mediator between God and sinners, and that's the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Nicodemus came to Jesus one night, and he got it wrong. He said, we know that you're a teacher come from God. Wrong. Jesus wasn't a teacher come from God. He was God come to teach. When Joan of Arc was martyred, lashed to that stake, and as the flames began to engulf her, as she died, she cried out, Jesus! 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 And that's why a preacher once said, the name of Jesus is your passport to heaven. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, let's all stand to our feet, everyone standing. If you have never been saved, if you've never been born again, you can get saved this morning. If you'd leave your seat from up there in the balcony or on the main floor and come to one of these men standing down here and say, I need to be saved. I'm not sure that when I die, I'm going to heaven. We're going to have a Bible gospel conversation with you and show you from the Word of God how you can know without a shadow of a doubt that you're saved, forgiven, and on your way to heaven. Have new life in Christ. Some of you need to present yourself for a believer's baptism. And I want you to slip out wherever you are and come take one of these men by the hand and say, I need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Some of you may feel like the Holy Spirit is... In fact, you know in your heart, leading you to join this church. Say, what should we do? Here's the first thing you ought to do. Just come down, tell one of these men, you know, we're saved and we know it. We've been baptized to show it. We want to join this church. And, uh, and then we'll take care of the rest. But you're invited to do that right now. Maybe you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Whether you come to this altar, these altars are open. If you want to come and just kneel here and say, Jesus, be Lord of all the kingdoms of my heart, feel free to do that this morning. Holy Spirit of God, move in this invitation time. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. As we sing together, you come right now. Lord, I...